The highest compliment that the New York Times book review can pay to any book is to say, this is a great redemptive story. Now, many of the people writing the book reviews are atheists, agnostics, but they can look at a book and they can say, wow, this is a great redemptive story. Without even understanding it, they are giving tribute to the great redemptive story, the prototype redemptive story that casts a shadow that all lesser redemptive stories are made of. The, the headwaters, and then there's the lesser streams of redemptive stories, but they all come from this one. I write novels as well as nonfiction, and whenever I write a novel, I do what novelists do, which is you, you start the story in a certain way, you try to make a powerful beginning, and you're gonna lead to what will be, in some sense, a triumphant ending not always triumphant in the normal way we think of that, but nonetheless, a triumphant ending where there's been much character change and normally change for the better in the life of the main character. But in between the great powerful beginning and this wonderful ending in this redemptive story is a whole lot of stuff that goes wrong. And like any novelist, I put my characters through misery as the story goes on. And isn't it strange that when we look at a drama and when we read a novel, we actually enjoy reading about the kinds of things that in real life we hate to have happen. Isn't that true? And part of the reason is because we know this is going somewhere and we know that it's, the author is going to turn this corner somehow and weave the threads together and there's going to be a redemptive purpose. And in the end, there will be some level of, uh, of celebration. But meanwhile, things have gone terribly wrong. Well, guess what? The Bible is the greatest redemptive story ever told. It's the story of God at work in this world. And sure enough, powerful beginning, he makes the world perfect. Powerful ending, the one of your handouts uh, relates to this. You've got the first two chapters of Genesis and you've got the last two chapters of Revelation, the very beginning and the very end of the book. And unfortunately, we don't have time to really look at that handout, but it's, uh, it's there for you, uh, the past, present, future, and just notice all along the way that there is the present, and the present is where we live. So at the beginning of the story, it's great, it's powerful, the end of the story, it's wonderful, it's triumphant, it's the middle where all things go wrong. Guess where we're living? in the middle of the story. But if we grasp the beginning and the end of the story, the ending that will never end, as C.S. Lewis said at the end of the Chronicles of Narnia, that great story that goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before. That's not fairy tale, that's the promise of God. That's why Jesus came into the world to not only redeem us, but to redeem the world itself. The great biblical promises of new heavens and new earth. These are things that I deal with in, in detail in my big book on heaven and some smaller ones as well. But these are things that we have neglected but as evangelicals and we neglect to our peril because we leave people sometimes living in the middle of the story, seeing the pain and the suffering, but not really understanding where they've come from and where in the sovereign grace of God they are headed for all eternity. This is the captivating story, the great unfolding drama of redemption. The main character in God's story is Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth. Carpenters make things and they fix things. Jesus made the world, the world went terribly wrong, and Jesus is going to fix the world permanently, and this is the gospel. This is the story of salvation, the story of redemption. 